Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Kyla Scanlon, financial commentator and entrepreneur. Kyla, nice to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about what you do and how you describe your career? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a little bit difficult to describe it perfectly, but I produce social media content, so TikTok, YouTube, I have a newsletter and a podcast, and then I also work with Bloomberg Opinion. Um, I'm writing a book with Penguin Random House about the economy, trying to do some TV shows about the economy as well. So the whole goal is financial education, um, helping people understand the economy around them, yeah. And your company is called Bread, as in, give me some bread, right? Right, right. And, and how, does the, how does your business model work, if I can ask? Well, so so Bread is one idea that I had where it was to develop some sort of software on financial education, but now it's morphed into a media company. And the idea is to produce content at every level. So anybody who wants to learn about the economy, whether it be they learn through video, they learn through audio, they learn through written word, will have some way that they can go and access that content. So Bread has become an economics education company. And what about your book? It's called In This Economy? Right. Is that how you're supposed to say it? Yeah. In This Economy? I would right? your hands like that too. Right, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is it about? So it's about the economy. It's about um, inflation, the labor market, the Federal Reserve, um, just giving people the tools that they need to understand what's going on around them. And at the end, it's talking about policy solutions. So how can we make the economy that we live in a little bit better? But it's meant to be a reference guide for those people who are a lot of people who are like, I don't really know what it means when the Fed raises rates, or I don't really understand what it means when we say that we have more jobs, like why is the unemployment rate low, that sort of stuff. So it's meant to be a guide for people to really reference when they talk about the economy. Yeah, I want to get into what young people need to understand or what you think they want to uh, learn about when it comes to financial markets. But first of all, I want to ask you about your upbringing. You grew up in Kentucky and started trading stocks or were interested in the market in uh, high school. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was just something interesting to do, uh, trading options, which was really Maybe not the best. And my parents were supportive. They were like, sure. Why did you get into that? What what made you interested in it? My, my dad had dabbled in it. Like, he, he does that now. Um, and so he was like, this is a cool way for you to explore mathematics and understand how markets work. So he was a big influence. He didn't work in the finance industry at all. He was doing all this on the side. Hmm. Um, and so he was a big influence on getting into markets and understanding them. You know? Right. And you live in Denver now. How did you end up there, pick to live there? Yeah, so I had moved out to Los Angeles after I graduated school to work at Capital Group out in like Burke on the Buy Side, do all that stuff. And then I ended up leaving them to work at a tech startup and build out their investment education arm. And with all of that, I was able to really get a grip on what I wanted to focus on, which was economics education. And I could do that remotely. <laughs> and so Denver has a lot of sports. And I really like sports like biking and running um, and snowboarding. So Denver has all of those things. So that's how I ended up moving there, yeah. You put out a lot of your content on social media, TikTok, Instagram, et cetera. How did you first get into that, though? Making a video and putting it out there and then people liked it? How does that begin? Uh, yeah. So I started making videos after I left Capital Group, like no longer under compliance. And they were mostly about science and what I was reading in different research papers. And then GameStop happened. And I was like, oh, this would be a cool thing to explain. And I had kept this blog all throughout college about my options trading experience. And so I had been used to creating content. And now I was aware of TikTok, which was a way of making video content. And so I was like, oh, I'll just do some of my blog posts in video form. Um, and had done these different skits explaining like the $1 million deli, if you remember that, like that crazy story. I just started making these videos and posting them on Twitter. And people were like, these are funny, and, and it worked out, yeah. So you started on Twitter, and now you're on Twitter and, and I said, Insta and TikTok. And so do you do different pieces of content on different platforms? Talk to us about your social media strategy. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. So TikTok was the main one, and then cross-posting to Twitter. Uh, I do Instagram Reels. So I make one short-form video a day explaining something. I'll make one video a day and post that on TikTok, on YouTube Shorts, on Instagram Reels. And then I produce one newsletter a week, which can be anything from media literacy to how we should think about inflation. Um, and yeah, so like a newsletter, podcast, all of that stuff. Do you do it all yourself? How do you make these videos? I mean, they're, you know, produced. 
you're doing it yourself in your house? But yeah, so I edit them, um, film them, edit, and and yeah, post them. Are they essentially the same on the different platforms? The short form videos are all the same on the different platforms. Um, but the YouTube is normally a little bit more in-depth, and then when I cut the audio for the podcast, that is uh, a little bit different as well. And they're just popular by word of mouth? Did you have to do marketing? Did you have to do ad campaigns or anything? No, I feel really grateful. Uh, people just resonated with it. The goal is to humanize finance, right? So that's why I incorporate a lot of philosophy into my work, uh, especially in the newsletter and also a lot of humor into the short form videos is because there's one way to explain the markets, which is in a very stodgy way, <laughs> which I think a lot of us are very used to. And then there's another way, which is incorporating humor because sometimes the things that happen are pretty funny. And that's what I try to focus on is like, the whole goal is to get people to want to pay attention. And in order to do that, you have to make things that they want to pay attention to. And so it's a lot of iterations on, on style, yeah. And something resonates more and you'll sort of continue that vein and that style of, of a way to communicate? But I change it up. So I used to do a lot of skits. I used to pretend to be the stock market. I still pretend to be Jerome Powell whenever there's an FOMC meeting. But now I do a lot of whiteboard work uh, where I'll draw things out on a whiteboard. And I'll probably switch that up again too. Like you can't get stale with it. Like you have to always be iterating on how you're presenting ideas to people because one way will work for some people and then another way will work for other people. And so it's just about remaining um, innovative in how I do that. What's different about how young people want to get financial information? Is that it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like they're going to be a little bit less likely to read a news article versus watching a short form video. So it's about being where they are, which is why I do a lot of short form video work because a lot of young people are on TikTok, they're on YouTube Shorts, they're on Instagram Reels, and that's just how they end up consuming content. So you have to be where they are, yeah. You have a huge following on these platforms, hundreds of thousands of people. Do people recognize you in the airports and stuff sometimes? Yeah, sometimes. Um, I was in Chicago last week and somebody came up to me and they were like, I love you. And so I got a little marriage proposal, which was sort of funny. But yeah, it's a, it's um it's interesting. Yeah, people recognize me and will say hi, which is really wonderful. Were you there? Was this when you were interviewing Mary Daly, the uh, chief of the Fed in San Francisco, right? So tell us about that. That must have been interesting, right? Yeah. So this is actually um, I think my third time that I got to interview her, but mm -hmm. this is the first time in person, and it was just the whole goal is, and I think the Fed is starting to focus on this, is how do we get young people to pay attention to markets? And the talk was about that, like how is the Federal Reserve, um, how are they interpreting how young people think about things? How are they going to communicate to young people about what's going on in the economy? And so that was the goal of that talk, is like how do we, how do we make things accessible and relevant to the younger generation? What do you think, Kyla, young people are most concerned about financially? Oh my gosh, I mean, I think everything. Uh, so one thing that I've been really thinking about a lot is this lack of beginner mode. So the Mitsubishi Mirage is one of the last cars that's selling for under $20,000 and they're discontinuing it in 2025. And so now there's not a lot of cars that are under $20,000. You know, we have a housing crisis, it's really difficult to get a starter home. Um, and then I think also the starter jobs idea too, like whether it be elite overproduction or just um, the struggle to find a job that will pay a wage that matches the lifestyle inflation or the rent inflation, whatever it be. I, I think that like, it's just really hard for young people to have a stepping stone. So now you kind of have to, you don't have a stone in the middle, like you have to hop to the next stone and that hop is scary. Part of it is a desire to like not work the same way that work has always worked. So when we think about like corporate offices or like nine to fives, there's a little bit of resistance to to that too. Like young people, I think, want to work a little bit differently. And then in terms of the housing crisis, like a home is the main way to build wealth in America. Like if you look at wealth breakdown, you know, the bottom 50% of Americans, all of their wealth is tied up into their home. And so for a lot of people, it's like, oh, if I achieve a home, then I've achieved the American dream. And and the same with like a starter car or whatever. So I think for young people, it feels like the American dream is eroding. And you could say that about any generation, right? Like Gen X could have felt the same way, boomers could have felt the same way. But I think it's just a little bit more visceral right now because of how expensive things have gotten over the past few years. I mean, you have a pretty wide purview. You've got, you know, houses and cars and interest rates and the Fed. What about core investing to 
young people care about that? Are they saving money? You know, and, and do you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's like two threads there. So there's this aspect of financial nihilism, which I've written about before, where young people will be like, well, I'm never going to retire, so why would I save for retirement? That is so bizarre to me. And so I think that's something that is hard, is that it's like, well, why would I save money if I'm not going to ever be able to reap the benefits of having a nest egg at the end. And I think that there's a lot of interest in investing and a lot of interest in the stock market, but there's uh, friction in, in getting there. Like you there you have all these apps like Public, Robinhood, whatever, where it is accessible to invest, but the idea of like putting your money into the stock market or trying to understand what the stock market is feels really difficult and dark for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I do talk about because going back to that point that I made earlier, you know, the bottom 50%, all their wealth is tied into their home. If you look at the top 10%, all of their wealth is tied into business ownership and stocks. And so the main way that we can redefine wealth in the United States, especially for young people, is giving them access to business ownership opportunities as well as giving them access to the stock market. And so I think it's incredibly important that we figure that out, but it obviously a lot of people have been working on that, and it's not something that's super easy to do. Right, mm -hmm. and it sounds like one of the things you were sort of alluding to was that fire concept. Yeah, yeah. Is that still popular with young people? Just sort of like, you know, you want to save a lot of money so you can stop working. Yeah. You know, at thirty-five or forty or something, right? I think a lot of people do want the idea of what fire offers, but really, what fire represents is freedom. Like, it doesn't represent not working, if that makes mm. sense, uh, I, I think. Or I think that's what people are seeking. They're like, okay, well, I don't want to work anymore, but they still have, like, other projects that they'll end up doing. That They just want the financial safety net to be able to explore what they're passionate about. So I don't think FIRE is as popular because the, the jobs are still status, right? Like, people still want to work. And they still want to be able to produce things. Um, they just want to be able to produce it under their own terms and in things that they're passionate about. And so I think that's what we're seeing in the labor market now is like people are like, well, you know, I have this job, but how do I also explore what I truly care about? What about crypto? Is that something that you weigh in on or, or are interested in? I used to work with some crypto companies back in the golden days, but I think that crypto lost its way a while. Um, so for them, it's like, you know, how do you promise something that is both a speculative asset and then it's also supposed to be a currency, right? So I don't think they've fully defined what the underlying tool is meant to be, especially with Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, but I think there's a lot of cool things that are being built with the technology of crypto. I want to ask you a little bit about your take on the markets, for instance, and, and the Fed. What do you think about the job that Jay Powell is doing? So my take on the Fed is they have a very difficult job and they have a very limited toolkit. They have raising rates, the balance sheet, and Fed speak, right? So how do they influence how expensive money is? How do they influence how money flows throughout markets? And then how do they talk about all the things that they're doing? And so I think the Fed has gotten kind of lucky with how fiscal policy has done. So fiscal policy has essentially saved us from a recession. The fact that, you know, Bidenomics happened, the CHIPS Act happened, the IRA happened, all of those things have been really supportive to the underlying economy. The Fed has been raising rates, but I don't think that we've seen rates really take hold in a lot of aspects of the economy, except for housing, right, where mortgage mm -hmm. rates are now 8%. Um, so I think the Fed has done what they can with what they have, but I'm not sure if their toolkit is effective in achieving the goals that they want to to have. And I don't know if the goal should be 2% inflation. Like I do think a lot of people are pushing back on that, like this arbitrary-ish number. It's like, why are we going to potentially sacrifice the labor market for that, right? Right, and sort of fiscal policy has been at odds with monetary yeah. policies, right? Yeah. Got it. And then what about the stock market? Are stocks too pricey? What do you think? I mean, I think it's an interesting time for the stock market because now you have the bond market where you can get 5% essentially risk-free. Yeah. And so I think stocks are looking less and less attractive for a lot of people. Um, and they've totally like not traded on fundamentals forever, right? So they're just sort of speculative tools. Um, but I think that it, it can be considered pricey, especially if you think about reconciling the valuations relative to fundamentals, yeah. And final question, Kyla, where do you see yourself five, 10, 15 years from now? What are your goals in terms of your career? I mean, I'm like really grateful for where I am now. Like being in this room with you is really wonderful and having all the opportunities that I have, especially with the book. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think 
for me, it's just about how can we get more people to understand the world around them? Because if you live in a system that you don't understand, like if you don't understand why the Fed is raising rates, if you don't understand how inflation and unemployment are related, it can be really overwhelming and really confusing, and it can lead you to make decisions that are maybe not the best decisions for you. So in 10, 15 years, I just hope that I'm still pursuing that goal in a meaningful way. It's like helping people understand the world around them. Kyla Scanlon, financial commentator and entrepreneur, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.